Hello and welcome to this, the ninth of a series of Bible studies that follows the prophetic threads within the scriptures. The threads that we are looking at in particular are those which describe the promises given to Abraham on behalf of God's people. A specific piece of land, a specific group of people that were to become the Jewish nation and the blessing that spreads out to the nations. So in the last video, we continued looking at what the prophet Daniel has to tell us about some of the times that lay ahead of him and the rest of God's people. Chapter 8, if you remember, gave us an insight into the near future um, as Daniel was shown the vision of a ram and a goat. That vision was immediately interpreted for him by the angel Gabriel, who told him about the coming Persian and Greek empires. Focusing mainly on the Greek empire that was brought about by Alexander the Great for some 200, 250 years after Daniel. Chapter 9 gave us an amazing example of praying for a nation as Daniel prayed for his people. He prayed as if he was taking responsibility for all the past unrighteousness upon himself. He was identifying with the sins of the nation and asking God to forgive them and restore them. But chapter 9 ended with an extraordinary revelation about the coming times as Gabriel gave him understanding of a 70-week time scale that was broken down into three distinct periods of time. Now remember that in a Hebrew uh, thinking, a week can be considered seven years. History indicates that the first two periods of time appear to match the time when a word went out to restore and build Jerusalem around the time of Ezra and Nehemiah until an anointed one would be cut off, which is commonly taken to be the crucifixion of Jesus. But that leaves one week. And that's a week that most people will consider to be somewhere in even our future. Um, because the description of that week was not a pretty one, seemingly including wars and desolations and destructions apparently like nothing we have seen yet. So this week we're moving into the final three chapters of the book of Daniel. We're taking all three because they all relate to a single dramatic vision, one of which Daniel himself called a great vision. Interestingly, chapter 10 is given over to the response of the prophet himself, a rare insight into his thoughts and feelings, and that sense of the importance of the, of the moment for God's prophetic messengers. Actually, there's also a deeper reason for this insight, because the whole of the book of, of Daniel and the life of Daniel himself is a prophetic statement about how to live in troubled times, one that we would do well to take note from and learn for ourselves. You see, Daniel and his friends demonstrated a continuing determination to be righteous before God and others, before Jew and Gentile, in all the challenging situations that he and his friends found themselves in. Uh, fiery furnaces and lion's den and probably other things that we're not told about. And all of this for a period of 70 years in exile as slaves in a foreign land. Now in chapter 10, we're told that Daniel was in mourning for three whole weeks. We're not told what he was mourning for, but I think we may reasonably assume that it was for some matter to do with the return of the Jews to Jerusalem. Clearly, he laboured all that time, probably spending many hours in prayer, whilst eating only plain food, uh, such as he was, was his concern for his people and the purpose of his God. He already had some idea of what lay ahead um, for him, 
and his people and region. So for sure, those matters would have weighed heavily on him. Now we get some idea of the weightiness that Daniel felt when he had an encounter with a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold round his waist, whose words were like the sound of a multitude. Now his friends fled into hiding and he was left alone and his radiant appearance was fearfully changed and he retained no strength. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine yourself in such a situation when you're overcome by the moment? What would you do? Anyway, we're told that God had concern for his prophet, this mighty man of God who was striving in prayer so much. Um, God knew that David, sorry, Daniel, had set his heart to understand. Can you really take note of that? Daniel had set his heart to understand. And so this man in linen helped Daniel to stand up and he encouraged him by telling him he's greatly loved. Now this man, who seems to have been a high-ranking angel, assured Daniel that he'd come because of his words had been heard by God. Even so, uh, he had delayed by the prince. He had been delayed uh, by the prince of Persia for twenty-one days, until Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help him. Um, so this is a helpful insight into the operation of the powers and principalities in the heavenly realms and gives us an idea of how we can pray into those sorts of issues. We come now to the specific word in chapters 11 and 12. It will help us to understand the structure of chapter 11 first and this chapter can be best described as having both near prophetic application and distant prophetic application and reference to known historical events can help us here. So with this in mind, um, the chapter divides into four sections. Firstly, verses 2 through to 20 seem to fill into the near prophetic category because the events described here can be referenced to the historical um, period from the time of this vision, that's about 536 BC, right the way through to the beginning of the reign of the Seleucid king, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, uh, in 175 BC. So you've got, what, 350 years or something there. Secondly, verses 21 to 35 describe prophecies that were apparently fulfilled um, in the time of Antiochus IV, yet it would also seem likely that they can also represent a foreshadowing of a similarly powerful, aggressive and unpleasant character to come later. Um, actually, we have to be careful here because we can apply that description or can try to apply that description to um, a number of historical people, even indeed to people, to certain people around today. Um, but the totality of biblical insights over the whole of Daniel and other books as well help us to understand that they don't properly fit the description that's given in Scripture. Now, as a particular example, the last five verses, 35, 31 to 35, talk about the activities related to the abomination of desolation beyond what Antiochus IV did. You see, he sacrificed a pig to the Greek god Zeus on the altar of the temple in Jerusalem around 168 BC. Uh, it was, I mean, that was bad enough of an action of itself uh, and it was an action that the Jewish people would certainly have seen as an act of desecration. But 500 years later Jesus um, refers to the abomination of desolation that was spoken of by the prophet Daniel. And if you remember, that's the bit in, in Matthew where Jesus says, let the reader understand. Um, 
and it was obviously talking as if something was to happen after that time. So that's Matthew 24, verse 15. Um, which, of course, therefore, it indicates a further long-term fulfilment. Now, verses 36 to 39 um, form a third section and do not really appear to have any direct historical correlation. And you might therefore consider them um, as the religious activities of this unpleasant character who is to come later. And then finally, the last few verses of chapter 11, that's verses 40 to 45, they don't seem to have any historical significance either um, and may similarly be best considered as the military activities um, of this same unpleasant character. So, who is this unpleasant character? Well, it seems that the focus of this particular prophetic vision really occurs uh, in the first three verses of chapter 12, where we find reference to the fact that there will be a time of trouble such as never has been. And at that time, everyone whose name is written in the book shall be delivered. Now, to me, um, I would suggest that that sounds rather like the closure of the age when Jesus will return as king, as judge, and as bridegroom. But let's backtrack a touch. A large part of Daniel's writing in chapter 11 is about Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who many consider to be a type, a pricey type if you like, of the final man of sin, the one who is to be the persecutor of the Jews, the one who is called the Antichrist. And at verse 36, the focus shifts to the future fulfilment, to the man known as the Antichrist, the one who is against Christ, and the one trying to stop Christ Jesus, that is Messiah Jesus, uh, from returning in triumph. So it would seem that we've arrived at a likely description of some of the characteristics of the Antichrist, this coming unpleasant character. And he was to be the one who will bring about this time of trouble. So let's see what we can learn from chapter 11. We've already said that Antiochus was a prototype of the Antichrist. So what do we know about how he behaved? Well, um, chapter 11, verse 21, and the history books tell us that Antiochus really was a contemptible person who came in without warning and to whom royal majesty had not been given. History tells us that he murdered his own brother to get the throne. Yet at the same time, he went out of his way to appear friendly to his own, popula own population. Um, he would appear in the, the local bazaar, in the local baths, for example, with his, the local population. Um, yet at the same time, he also thought nothing of using deceit and flattery to secure his throne and get what he wanted. So from that lot, it would seem reasonable to presume that the Antichrist will apparently arise from nowhere and be a person of deceit and flattery. And presumably also initially at least, you know, he will appear quite a nice person perhaps. And to those who actually acknowledge him as leader, he will give them authority under his leadership. Now, Antiochus IV Epiphanes um, was also considered to be an eccentric by his own population. And that gave rise to his nickname, Epimenes, um, which I think we've talked about this before, but it's a play on words and it means madman. <laughs> Not inappropriate, you might think. Um, so might that also indicate that the general world population won't take the Antichrist seriously to start with? Now, the Seleucids, like the Ptolemies before them, um, had generally respected Jewish culture and Jewish institutions. But that policy was dramatically reversed by Antiochus IV who forbade many 
traditional Jewish practices and began, began a campaign um, of persecution against devout Jews culminating in the desecration of the temple which ultimately triggered the Maccabean revolt in 167 BC. Now Daniel has already spoken about this coming Antichrist uh, who would reverse the freedoms of the Jewish people and put an end to sacrifice and offering and making desolate and we learned about that from chapter 9 and verse 27. Uh, as it turns out, of course, that was foreshadowed by the actions of, of uh, Antiochus IV. Uh, it's worth noting again here, of course, that down the course of history, there have been many individuals who at first glance might seem uh, to have shown similar characteristics to the coming Antichrist, even into modern history, even perhaps into current day uh, history. But actually, none of those individuals, together with the circumstances of their times, horrific though they may have been or may be, um, none of them have fitted all the requirements of prophecy. Now, as a side note here, um, Judah Maccabeus uh, was a Jewish priest who led the Maccabean revolt against Antiochus and the Seleucid Empire. And it resulted in Israel having control of its own destiny for close on a hundred years until the time of the Roman Empire, which is what, roughly 60 years or so before Jesus. Um, incidentally, the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah, meaning dedication, commemorates the purification of the temple and restoration of Jewish worship in 164 after um, Antiochus had desecrated it a few years before. Uh, this is the origin of the nine-branched menorah, or the Hanukkah, um, which is used for this celebration. Yeah, it's not to be confused with the seven-branched menorah that's used in the temple. So, what can we learn about the religious attitudes of the Antichrist? Well, for starters, we're told that he'll be very arrogant and exalt himself above other gods. Uh, in fact, he will claim to be above God himself. Uh, chapter 11, verse 36. In other places, we learn that he will utter blasphemies and pompous words, earlier chapters of Daniel and, and 2 Thessalonians. We're told also that he will worship war, honouring the god of fortresses. Uh, in chapter 11, verse 38. And, and also with the help of foreign god demonic no doubt what about his military activities this is an interesting one actually because at the time of the end it is clear that he will engage in battle as the kings of the north and south attack him chapter 11 verse 40 he will stretch out his hand against other countries including egypt and north africa and ultimately he will pitch his palatial tents between the mediterranean sea and the glorious holy mountain that is jerusalem so it would seem from these and other verses that not everything is going to go the way that the Antichrist wants it. Interesting. So we can then ask why God gives us information about the Antichrist's religious and military activities. Basically, it's so we're forewarned, forearmed, so that we can pray with divine information. We're given prophetic insight so that we can pray ahead of time. Um, for example, there's going to come a time when the church will be saying that there is war, when the rest of the world will be saying, no, 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 there's peace, 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 when there is no peace. Jerusalem, uh, Jeremiah, chapter 6, verse 14, and also in 8, 11. So, ultimately, this assures us that the Antichrist will not dominate all the nations on earth. Apparently, at least, Egypt and Syria will be fighting him. So all of this enables us to prepare believers for the turbulent times ahead, knowing that it's for a short time, and to be able to respond in faith and not in fear. So how does this leave um, our faithful servant Daniel? How's he left? 
Well, God tells him to go his way, to make a mental departure from his questioning and be content with what God has revealed thus far. You see, Daniel was told that the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. In other words, the further revealing of these things will have to wait until the time of the end. So, where does the story go after Daniel? Well, Daniel himself hears of the end of the exile, uh, but it seems that as he is serving the new king, Darius the Mede, uh, he stays in Babylon. Now, the first group of exiles, some 55,000 of them, return to the Holy Land with Zerubbabel to make a start on rebuilding the temple, albeit not without um, some opposition, and we learn about that in the book of Ezra. After several false starts, it took another king, Darius, this time Darius the Great, to find a copy of the original decree, as is now about 515 BC, uh, and order the rebuilding of the temple to be completed, some 23 years after the return from exile. That's in Ezra chapters 5 and 6. Now Ezra the scribe himself goes home with a small group of people some 40 years, 47 years rather, after that. Um, that is um, about 70 years after the end of the exile. We learn about that in Ezra chapter 7 and 8. Then we learn about Nehemiah who was sent to rebuild the walls which were still broken down about 25 years after Ezra. Um, so we're getting on for about a hundred years after the end of the exile. Um, Nehemiah's return is talked about in Nehemiah's chapters 1 and 2. And in that part of the world, world in those days, of course, no walls meant no protection. We then enter a, a silent period, so far as the Bible is concerned, for some 400 years until the time of Jesus. But during that time, the Jewish people became very solid and single-minded in their faith. Uh, some of the Jews were in Judah, the only land they could really call their own under different foreign occupations. Many more were scattered around the Middle East, becoming intermixed with other nationalities. So, finally, we leave the Old Testament and head into the New in the next session. Uh, but what are the promises given to Abraham all those centuries before, back in Genesis chapter 12 and verses 1 to 3. The promises of being a great nation, uh, having a land and having, being a blessing to the nations. Well, it has to be said that they were hardly a great nation at the end of the Old Testament. Sadly, they were divided into Judah and Samaria. Uh, they were living under Roman rule. Um, and for sure, some of them were in part of the Promised Land, but most were scattered around the rest of the Middle East. And apart from notable exceptions like Daniel and Queen Esther, um, there weren't been that much of a blessing to the other nations. I mean, there obviously were others, but by and large, there weren't been completely that blessing that they were supposed to be. Now, there's also a lot more that we can learn about the end of the age from the Old Testament that we've not looked at. Um, from the other books was in the Old Testament. And I'm thinking of Isaiah, of Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Zechariah and, and, and the others. Um, but that study is for another time and another day. So thank you so much for watching. We look forward to seeing you in the New Testament in the next session. God bless you and goodbye.